Koppel, host of the Time for Coffee podcast, where you get firsthand career advice into the jobs and industries that interest you the most. And before we start today's show, I have a quick favor to ask you. If you haven't already, I'd be incredibly grateful if you give us a rating and a review on iTunes. And if you're like me, you need to do it now because you'll forget later and because it's the best way to help others who may be in search of career advice to find this free resource. So press pause if you haven't done it and do it right now. I'll wait. Thanks so much and enjoy today's show. Hey there, Java Junkies. Welcome back to another Espresso Shots episode of t for c If you're interested in breaking into the food and beverage industry, especially into the specialty coffee business, then this is the episode for you. Because my next guest is the co-founder of Birch Coffee, which is a New York City-based coffee roaster and chain of cafes offering specialty coffees from around the world. But before I introduce you to Paul Schlater, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's T4C's weekly newsletter that's got unique firsthand insights into dozens of different industries from the professionals like Paul who are actually working in them. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org, and the sign up box is right there. Now, my Sumatra drinking specialty coffee lovers, please grab a mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated brew because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Paul Schlater, the co-founder of New York City-based Birch Coffee. Paul is one of those aspiring entrepreneurs who dreamed of starting his own business from a young age, and he actually wanted to skip college and go straight into the working world. But his parents convinced him to pursue another interest he had, acting. And so Paul enrolled in the American Musical and Dramatic Academy. And like so many aspiring actors, Paul continued working in restaurants after graduation to pay the bills. But unlike his theater peers, Paul actually preferred the hustle of hospitality to the bustle of Broadway. It was the smell of fresh roasted organic Sadamo coffee that offered a pretty big hint of his future professional path. So when his buddy Jeremy Lyman said he was thinking about starting a specialty coffee business from the ground up, Paul was all in. Paul, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? Andrea, I am caffeinated. I am ready to go. Let's go. Awesome. So as the co-founder of Birch Coffee, I got to ask you, man, what are you drinking? Most days, uh, this is, I, I might get just blown up for this. Cold brew, most days. It's a quick, easy go to for me. I, I tend to take my time, you know, doing cuppings and other things, but my, our cold brew, which is a coffee from one of our farms in, in San Miguel in, in Guatemala, our partner farms, uh, that is my, my go to every day. Multiple Very times. nice. You know, I've just recently gotten into cold brew. And yay! 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 <laughs> although I do have a full bar here and I could I offer you some hot if you wanted. I see it. that. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. <laughs> okay. Well, I am so psyched to talk about the quick service industry, which is mm-hmm. QSR, I think is the mm-hmm. shorthand as you and I were chatting before we started, and to help our viewers and listeners learn how they can break into this really demanding and also challenging industry. So let's dive into our 10 espresso shots, Paul. The first question is, what entry-level jobs are available to young people who want to break into quick service, whether it's coffee or whether it's food and beverage, another beverage? Specifically, as it as it relates to to coffee, Andrea, the a position of a a cashier or barista is you know a, a great entry position for for young people. Specifically in New York, 
where pay is really good. You also have in within most coffee shops, you're part of a tip pool. And so I know without getting into the specifics of our, our crew's tips right now, they're, they're doing right well, which is it's really interesting, especially in, in this economy right now in New York City. Our cashiers and, and baristas are doing the best that they have. And that's really saying something, I think, to our to our customers. So that is that's a great position to start in. And I think from there there's there's always potential, at least with from what I've seen for for advancement, so long as it's their space. Yeah. And we should let our viewers and listeners know that we're doing this interview. Actually, it's the first day of fall. It's September twenty second, twenty twenty. So yeah. obviously we're talking about the middle of the coronavirus. And so yep. the service industry has been hit really hard by this. No, oh, absolutely. I mean, and not to be, you know, hyperbolic, but I mean, it's, it's specifically in New York, it's been, I mean, near the worst that I've, that I've ever seen. I, I've never seen anything remotely like this when, you know, stores are, are shuttered for, for blocks. I mean, it's, it's, I've never seen anything like this. So I don't, I don't think that that's a, an understatement. Yeah. Yeah. So what is a hard skill and a soft skill, Paul, that you look for in the young people that you hire at Birch Coffee? A hard skill. Can you just define those better for me? So I have a, a yeah, different... absolutely. So a hard skill is more of like a technical skill. So yeah. like your Q grader, cupping, right. that kind of thing versus soft skill, which is more like people skill, EQ, yeah. things of that so, nature. Thank you, Andrea. I appreciate your yeah. comments. The hard skills, if someone has comes in with, with experience in, in making coffee, we'll see if they, they meet our standard. Because what we have found in the past is that a lot of times people believe that they have a certain skill set. And then when they're tested, it may not live up to you know, where, they, where they truly are, which is completely fine. Because it's, it gives us a roadmap of how to, to get them to where we would like them to be. Right. The thing that we can't teach, uh, going to your soft skill, is is kindness, kindness and empathy. And I think now more than ever that those two skills are are imperative. And we will not, we won't move forward in an interview with someone that doesn't possess that. And we're able to to read that pretty quickly. So that to me is is the critical point for for someone that that's going to be coming on board. Uh, everything else is is quite trainable, and you know because we're just we're just working with water and ground coffee, things can be broken down so that people can get it. But the the empathy is if if it's not there, then you know it's 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 a challenging road to say the least. Yeah, no doubt. But no assholes are allowed to apply. <laughs> we would prefer none. We would prefer none. Some, you know, what are you going to do? There's, you know, we're in New York and sometimes we come across a couple, but uh, yeah, try to get none. <laughs> okay, good. What about someone's major, Paul? Yeah. Is it a deciding factor to get into this industry? No, I would say not at all. I mean, I think that if you're, if you're going to move into something, I mean, look, I wish that I had majored in agronomy <laughs> at, at this point, just because of, you know, all the work that we've done. In, in coffee growing regions, just so I have a, a more solid understanding in that respect. But the the industry is is very amenable to all walks and all people. And I think that was part of what drew me in so much to it because I had I had wanted a biology background and I never I never went for that, which is why the Q grading and all the tasting stuff like that kind of is my draw. But for anyone else, again, these are all things that are that are teachable so long as you have the ability to learn the nuance and sensory experience, those types of things are very, are very teachable. And then within, within management, I mean, look, if you have those skills, it can only open up doors for you. But I would definitely not say that it's a requirement. One of our top leaders doesn't have a traditional you know, college degree. And she's incredible. And I can't say enough good about her. So, and, as, and again, it's, it goes back to the empathy part, right? And just that, that ability to, to connect and, and um, work with individuals and, know, and knowing how to lead. So. Absolutely. What about a grad school degree? And this is less so for young people looking to work as baristas or mm -hmm. looking to work in your roastery or 
one of those entry level jobs and more so for someone who would one day like to start their own company. Are there certain grad school degrees that you think would be beneficial to get? I don't believe you have one. And, no, not at all. And Jeremy, yeah. does Jeremy have one, your co founder? Nope. Nope, our CFO, our, our CFO does, but he's the only one that has the, and I guess that makes the most sense. But outside of those, you know, those positions, what I have seen and found within our industry, and I guess longer term, perhaps having that degree would, I'm trying to think of the, the best way to say this, I haven't come across a lot of people in our industry who have secondary degrees, right? And that's not because you know, people aren't intelligent. It's just, it's just not something that's, that's commonplace within our industry. Now, this may shift, especially now this may shift, but in contact with other cafe owners that I know and other, you know, small business owners that I've connected with, most are at best you know, a bachelor's degree and then many don't, uh, like myself. And again, it only works to your advantage longer term, but I think this is a, a unique industry in that regard where if you have the skill set of knowing how to conduct yourself within a small business, the interpersonal skills, having that as just a, a benchmark, I think there is still space for you, if Absolutely. that answers your question. Yeah, totally. Okay. So the next espresso shot has to do with life experiences. So those experiences that we have outside the classroom. What, in your opinion, Paul, are the life experiences that our young listeners should try to cultivate if they want to get into this industry? I know as a young guy, you work in restaurants. There's a great mm -hmm. story you tell of like your grandfather giving you a Swiss army knife and the little scissors <laughs> on there and having to go <laughs> at it. Cut today. <laughs> <laughs> And have to cut yeah. off the vines that were grown around trees in this forest. I mean, there are all yeah. kinds of experiences. I interviewed another woman earlier today who is the youngest of nine kids. My wow. God, talk about birth order being a life experience. Yeah. So oh, no. what do you think are the most useful ones for them to try to get? For, for entering in this industry, I, I would... Service is so important and knowing how to work with another human being on their terms and learning that learning that line of communication with another person. I don't know that there is something more important than that. And I don't believe it just works. It's applicable strictly to, to our industry. But I think that that skill set cannot be understated. Like it's just it's so important to be able to to listen, to be able to know how to how to respond to someone, particularly when you have you know, in, in our industry, we get at any given point in time, you know, we can we can serve up to well, pre COVID, we can serve up to a hundred to hundred and fifty personalities within an hour. It's a lot of personality, right? And being able to know how to respond and maintain this kind of professionalism with them in those moments, it takes lots of time to to develop that. And to know that there are going to be people that are coming in looking for a battle that day, you know, so knowing how to, to allow that, that water to just kind of like roll off and, and move into the next, to help the next person, to help the next person. Because I mean, I'm sorry, Mike, I might go on a bit of a tangent here, Andrea. In our industry, we have the opportunity every morning to be someone's first interaction. And we train that as the, one of the greatest responsibilities because it gets to be a part of setting the tone for someone's day. If that is a negative interaction, that can go one way, right? So we are, are always looking at that responsibility of being someone's first interaction of the day as something that we hold very near and dear to our hearts, that it's, it's our responsibility to make that the, one of the better parts of their day. So. Well, I can certainly yeah. tell why Birch took <laughs> off the way that it has over the years, because with that as like your ethos, it makes it a place that people want to go to. Yeah, that is what drives us. It's always been about service, like first and foremost. So Fantastic. Yeah. So, Paul, what is the best part for you 
of being in the quick service industry, specifically being in the coffee industry? I, I feel like such a sellout saying this. I love the people that I get to interact with, particularly in, in New York City. I, I don't know. I can say confidently. I will would not have had the interactions with a lot of the people that I've been able to interact with in the, the last near 11 years were it not for for this industry were it not for 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 this like it just it just wouldn't have happened and so the the magnificent relationships that I've that I've built within within this are are absolutely it I mean hands down hands down yeah I love that answer and in fact I interviewed another person who spent many years in the coffee industry, his family founded Your Next, which I'm sure you're mm-hmm. familiar, yeah, yeah, familiar with. It's a coffee cleaning yeah. product. And we use it in all of our stores. Josh <laughs> did. Yeah. yeah, and when I asked Josh this question, he said the best part of being in this industry is the people. Yeah. So, it's, and not, not to put too fine a point on it, but it, it's the diversity within this industry is only becoming more rich. And so it's an exciting time uh, to, to be in coffee, even amidst all the, the kind of uncertainty that, that we're in right now. Understood. So the flip side mm-hmm. for you, Paul, what is the part of your current job that sucks the most? The current part uh, that sucks the most, I would say, you know, dealing with this pandemic sucks the most. I mean, there's no, there's no two ways about it. I mean, we've had to, you know, starting on March, on March 15th, we had to lay off all of our staff. I had to get on a, I had to get on a, a call with all of our managers and our HR and our director of operations and everyone. And I had to lay them all off because, and, we were, and put some on furlough because we were going to not have money very quickly. And so we had to make some some very drastic decisions, and it was singularly the I mean, to to use your words suckiest part of my job, my career that I have that I've had was was that moment, and I have not experienced anything as painful as that as a a job provider. There was such a a unique I, I don't know that I can describe it well enough unless you had the good fortune to be able to provide a job for someone to then have to say to those same people, we have to take this away from you is beyond anything I'd like to do again. Fortunately, we've brought back a lot of people now that we're you know, reopening stores and, and doing things in this new environment. But there was a, a great deal of loss and people that we worked with that we won't be working with now for an, another long time, if, if ever again. And that's really sad. So. I would say that's the the suckiest part, and I'm sorry that that got so sad. But that is just well, that's just the kind reality. Of reality. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, yeah. I'm I'm so sorry for you and for all of the other business owners who had to do that because I know it's got to be gut wrenching. I can yeah. say that's probably one of the only good things about being a solopreneur, which is what I am. It's only yeah. me. It's only right. me. So. Totally. You know, three final espresso shots, Paul. Yeah. What is the best career advice you've ever got? To trust myself. It was the the best advice. I actually, it was my friend, Tracy Allen. He said I was preparing for my Q, my Q grade, which we spoke about. And he said to me, trust your gut. You know you're right. And I started applying that to everything else <laughs> in, in my business after that moment because it, it rang true for me. There was that, that kind of deciding moment. I, I, I do know what I'm doing. I am capable of these things. You know, that, that kind of that imposter syndrome that we, you know, some entrepreneur, oh, I won't paint everyone, but I carry is this imposter syndrome of how can I be doing this? I don't, I mean, I'm not qualified. Like what are my, you know, abilities to be able to do this, but we do because we care and we're all the things we discussed earlier. And because of those, I can not be perfect, but I will do my best. And I think that was absolutely the best career advice I, I got. So just tr- trust my gut and my mind. So a couple of things. One, shout out to Tracy Allen, 
mm-hmm. because he's the one who introduced us. What a yep. great and wonderful man, amazing advice. And yeah. the second thing is, it isn't just entrepreneurs who experience the imposter syndrome. And thank you so much for mentioning that. I would yeah. say at multiple points in my career and having interviewed hundreds of professionals now, mm. Paul, I can tell you that we come in all shapes and sizes <laughs> and <laughs> colors. And, you know, yeah. I think imposter syndrome is something that is very, very common. It's common for younger people and it's common for people when they're in different industries and taking on different roles. And, and it's something that it's just you need to face it head on and keep plowing ahead. <laughs> Two final espresso shots. What Please. movies, if any, or Netflix shows or Hulu, Amazon, whatever your favorite streaming service is, or books, do uh-huh. you think accurately depict your profession? Film about coffee does a pretty good job. That's a good one. Brandon Loper, I think, mm-hmm. uh, did that one. That's pretty solid. I, I thought that was a good film. Books, I would say The World Coffee Atlas by James Hoffman is still my, my... I use that as like a resource. We homeschool our kids. And so I use that to, to show region specifics with, with our kids around, around coffee. I, I love The World Atlas of Coffee. And Craft Coffee by is it Jessica Yesto. Yesto? Okay, I'm not sure. The craft coffee, it's craft coffee Emanuel. Anyways, that's okay. that does a that does a really good job also of just better defining, you know, our industry. I think it's what's what's interesting about this question, Andrea. When I when I first entered the industry, and this was in two thousand nine, it was and I've talked to to other to other friends and colleagues about this at the time, it was there was such a we were in a resource desert for for specialty. People were were so tight with information that they just they were just like, nope, not gonna share, not gonna share how I'm pulling my shots, none of your business. And it was really it was a really interesting period in time. Whereas now there seems to be this almost open source on how we do our business. And I think that's only going to further I mean, we're a small industry. I mean, especially coffee is very small, like comparatively speaking, right? And so the fact that we haven't always been this is kind of I think is does a disservice to our industry. Uh, but now that we're seeing more shifts towards have this information, let's let's all speak to it and let's continue to evolve and grow. I think only furthers what we're what we're you know doing as a as a collective. Absolutely fantastic. Well, we'll try to include links to those books and to the movies in our show notes. Final espresso shot. Yeah. What would Java junkies be surprised to learn about your industry, Paul? I would say that the the attention to detail within it is greater than what is commonly known, particularly behind the bar, that there's a precision to every element behind the bar, whether it's you know, brewing coffee, cold brew, especially in crafting any you know, espresso drink, roasting, cupping, all of this stuff is that there is a, there's a level of sophistication or refinement that, that exists. I don't want to peel with too broad of a brush and say that's underappreciated or unknown, but I think maybe less in our industry. Nice. Well, I certainly appreciate (laughs) all the subtleties of coffee. And I'm super excited to get more into what you do at Birch and what makes Birch so special in our main Time for Coffee interview. And I hope our viewers and our listeners will check out the bio, check out show notes to see if Paul's main Time for Coffee interview has already dropped. Paul, I want to thank you so much for making time for coffee today with me and the T4C community. I wish you and your family at Birch just continued good wishes. And I hope all Birch stores are back online before too much longer. Thanks, Andrea. That's really kind. I appreciate your words. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to this latest episode of T4C. 
And if you're interested in learning more about my coaching services for confused college students and recent grads, feel free to check out the Time for Coffee website under the Coaching tab at time, the number four, coffee.org, or text me at 202-236-5712. That's 202-236-5712. Thank you.